There's nothing like being introduced by a former professor uh, to uh, cause a little anxiety because uh, there's a little pressure to perform. Um, but I wanted to thank uh, uh, the organizers of this symposium. I want to thank uh, Dean Noria, uh, uh, President Bacow. Uh, this is a, a very timely topic, uh, something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm hoping that I can use my remarks today to try to add a little bit of a different element that I think um, we probably all entered this room thinking about, which is to really think about how we can build an ecosystem that actually incorporates real human values into the business and science of aging. Um, it's pretty clear that aging has been an extraordinary uh, financial success story in America. Uh, Americans spend billions of dollars on solutions to promote better aging. Some of them may seem frivolous to us. Others seem uh, like they're worthwhile endeavors. Um, there's, a, there's been significant investments in retirement living and retirement communities to uh, enable people to live better lives as senior citizens. There are uh, cosmetic solutions to delay the effects of aging's, aging pharmaceutical products to keep patients alive uh, healthier longer, and financial products to help people live uh, well through their retirement. And it's undeniable, uh, just given the interest in this room, uh, that private markets are very interested in aging. Billions of dollars of venture capital and private equity have flowed to companies with a stated intent of helping Americans live longer and better. And on the surface, they are. Uh, there are new medicines, new health plan products, new retirement concepts being hatched literally every single day. But when you look deep within from a human perspective, we see that as well as the business of aging has done financially, it hasn't delivered the kind of solutions that our society has needed. It's undeniable that aging has been good for business, but the question is whether business has actually been good for aging. Any of us who's walked a parent through our disjointed healthcare system knows that the healthcare industry is failing miserably at delivering on what patients and families need in their last years of life. Whether you're the president of Harvard or the dean of Harvard Business School, you have to make a phone call to actually make things go right for your parents or loved ones. Patients are bounced irreverently from primary care office to specialist office to hospital to skilled nursing facility, meeting strangers along the way, without the benefit of so much as the electronic transmission of your health information across all of those sites of care. We have new drugs and therapeutics to help patients live longer and better, but we have a broken business model that is increasingly putting life-sustaining medicines out of reach for the patients for whom they were developed. And I think at the heart of this disconnect is a fundamental problem of perspective. When I was a student here more than a decade ago, Two of my most memorable professors were Das Narayandas and Young May Moon. In case after case, each of them reminded us of the importance of getting into the literal shoes of your customers to unlock the power of their perspective. However, many of the people who drive the business of aging are operating asking what they may want rather than what seniors may need. They tend to apply heuristics that are appropriate for the median American consumer, but have little consideration in our place for senior care. They believe that seniors, particularly sick and particularly incapacitated seniors, want to shop for healthcare services like millennials, when in reality, they just want to be treated with dignity and respect and receive the best care that science can deliver. They believe that most seniors have incomes and life trajectories that are more akin to Harvard MBAs, nothing against Harvard MBAs, uh, than the more modest life lived by most Americans. And they, are, and they all too often believe that seniors are tech-avid digital natives, when in fact, I haven't yet met an app that truly improves patient care, despite billions of dollars invested towards this end. And so as a result, we have this. We have many entrepreneurs building Segway-esque products and services that test well with focus groups, but that are of limited real value to our society. We take a big box, Best Buy-like approach that commoditizes products and services and end up selling to people rather than selling for people or for our society. And so the consumerist approach has left us, frankly, no better. 
As an example, how many of you have received a link from your doctor's office to sign up for a portal like one of these? They look good on screen, they seem like they may work or add value to your patient care, but they don't actually reflect how real people, much less seniors, seniors with chronic illness and depression and bipolar disease, consume their healthcare services. They're incompletely populated. They don't link to one another. They don't allow you to do anything useful. And I tell you this as somebody who worked in the federal government trying to get physicians' offices to put portals like these into practice. I had this rude awakening a few months ago when my mother and my, you know, called me and said, you do senior care, why don't you come home and help me navigate these portals? I said, sure, it's no problem, I can help you with that. I generated six logins for her, um, none of which actually pro provided any value to her, and I just told her to forget about it. And every so often I get a nagging email from my mom saying, you know, I got a note from my doctor's office, I got to look in the system. I, and I always tell her, just forget about it, just pick up the phone and call them, because the reality is it's not actually adding any real value. Um, if they did get in, if we did get into the, into the shoes of the end user, um, as I was taught to do here, we might recognize that the bigger problem in society is not online access to one's medical records, but something far more profound or elemental, like loneliness, the sense of loss of human connection that too many senior citizens experience. I was very fortunate when I was a Harvard undergraduate uh, to wander into a class by a professor named Robert Putnam. Um, at the time, I had absolutely no idea who he was, and he told us he was gonna walk us through the primary research for his book, uh, his now iconic book, uh, Bowling Alone. And he walked us through reams of data, warning us about a coming plague of loneliness that would affect our society. One of Bob's colleagues on the Harvard faculty, K. Anthony Apaya, um, told us years ago that future generations would judge us for how badly we treat seniors and the plague of, of human isolation that they presently suffer. But the reality is, is as much as places like Harvard are warning the society about, about things that we should be warned about, we're not doing very much about them. In 2017, my organization, Care More Health, recognized this problem and began to screen all of our 90,000 senior patients uh, for loneliness. We appointed a chief togetherness officer, we built a robust outreach program, and we now connect with over 1,200 lonely seniors on a weekly basis, often acting as their only regular touch point with the world. On one level, we are proud that we were the first healthcare organization in the world to take on this issue at scale. But we were embarrassed too on behalf of our profession and our field the, that we acted more than 25 years after Bob warned us to do so. Last year, we began redesigning our waiting rooms so that they function more as community spaces and less as traditional medical office waiting rooms. Seniors no longer come and wait and stare at each other and stare at the reception desk waiting for their appointment. Um, they now use our waiting rooms as community spaces. They play board games with one another, build friendships and relationships. And as difficult as it might be for some of us with a lot of social capital to imagine, there are people who build real, lasting relationships and friendships sitting in this space. So I don't think we can actually get to where we want to get without a fundamental change. And something I'm hoping we can do today is to reframe our thinking about this topic from a conversation about business to a conversation about building a social movement. Because unless we imagine what we're here to do is something grander, something that requires changes in public policy, implementation of true human-centered design, and altogether new business models, we're gonna all fall short of our potential. And we'll have to pay the price for our failure when we ourselves become seniors. More than anything, I think we need a customer segmentation approach. That's a term I learned here, Nipton, probably from you. Um, that takes into account people who we often forget, and that is our society's most vulnerable seniors. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how CareMore has begun to accomplish this throughout its history. So just by way of background, we're a fully delegated, Medicare-focused healthcare organization that cares for patients in 10 states. That's industry speak for, we take full risk from insurance companies to actually manage all the care for our patients. We get a per member, per month check, and we're responsible for primary care costs, specialty costs, hospital costs, um, which then gives us the freedom to, I think, think a little bit more broadly about what we do. Um, we employ about 1,000 uh, clinical staff, doctors, nurses, um, and we operate 50 clinics, and then we also staff hospitals that we contract with. 
And so we've adopted a number of design principles that are specific to our business, but I think have broader applicability for our conversation today. The first is the notion that the business of aging should anticipate on and deliver on people's needs. I think the conventional wisdom among most is that consumers should just be making all of their decisions and that the world just needs empowered consumers and everything will be fine if we just give people the right information and the right ability to make their own decisions. But what if a senior was incapacitated or unable to actually make their decision or didn't necessarily think about all the things that they needed to think about at a moment that they were ill or diagnosed with cancer? So as an example, you know, some, some of the kinds of things we're doing is providing our, our patients with free transportation. It's not something that they asked for, but it's something that we recognize was a barrier for them to actually receive and access care. We recognize that oftentimes the, the barrier between a patient getting well uh, or, or going back to the hospital and getting readmitted was a meal when they came home. Um, we recognize that information doesn't necessarily flow through our, throughout our healthcare system because we have groups of strangers taking care of patients at every point of care. So we actually solve that problem by having the same physicians and nurses taking care of patients in the hospital, in SNFs, and in post-discharge follow-up care to provide the kind of, kind of continuity that frankly we all want. We call this a philosophy of radical common sense, but it's actually just doing the right thing. Our second principle is that aging people shouldn't have to always shop for care that they need. How frustrating is it when you have a loved one who's actually diagnosed with an illness to have to pick up the phone and call every single person you know who might know something about that disease and say, can you get me into Sloan Kettering or Dana-Farber or in our case, UCLA and, you know, get us to the right specialist at the right time. The reality is, is that the system should proactively identify the right group of clinicians, the right facilities to get your care, and that's something we do for our patients 100% of the time. And our third principle, and this is a bit radical, I think, in our current discourse, um, and I think probably around the discourse around the employee benefit plan here at Harvard, um, is that aging people shouldn't actually pay out of pocket for things that they need. Uh, the traditional conventional wisdom in the healthcare industry is that when costs go up, we just pass them on to our patients, right? Uh, every year you see your copays go up a little bit more, even for things that you absolutely should access. We're creating more and more barriers to the things that people need. So we have zero copays for primary care. Um, we have zero copays for insulin uh, because we know that it, you know, creating a barrier to insulin is probably the worst thing you actually want to do for a patient. Um, and we actually have zero copays for accessing our senior-focused exercise facilities that are attached to every single one of our clinics. Because if you actually do believe that exercise makes a difference for senior patients, and we do, we take care of over 30,000 diabetics and we think it's an absolutely essential part of uh, their clinical care, um, then we, we don't want to erect barriers that get in the way of them doing the right thing. And that's something we all have to think about, is what are the barriers that exist to actually creating access to the life-saving therapies and the right services that patients need. Um, and I think what's, what's, what's happened is, is that, um, you know, I think others are starting to pay attention. We've, we've partnered with Lyft uh, to implement the first ride-sharing program uh, for a medical organization um, with, 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 for our patients. And one of the amazing things about this partnership is that we didn't just send our patients the app and say, you know, the ride's on us because we recognize that many of our senior patients actually don't have smartphones. Um, we actually, before we launched this program, we invited our seniors to a town hall, and we asked 250 seniors in Southern California how many of them had heard of Lyft or Uber. And would you guys imagine how many hands went up? It's two. Uh, and it was because there were patients who had actually participated in our early pilot. Um, but what we did was we actually told seniors we were gonna make available these rides, um, and then we implemented it in a, in a very senior-focused way. We actually picked up the phone. Um, we, we, we requested the ride. We called the senior. Um, we called the driver. We let them know uh, where they needed to be dropped off and actually coordinated this so it wasn't this you know, very difficult digital act for, uh, for our seniors. Um, you know, one of the things that we've done is as the cost of insulin has been skyrocketing, there's been a lot of this in the media about the cost of insulin skyrocketing, we actually took a risk and we switched our patients to older insulins because we recognized that people on seniors on fixed incomes weren't gonna be able to pay 
the very high cost of uh, analog insulins. And we put them on human insulins. And um, some of the folks in this audience may think that that was actually giving people inferior care. Um, but we just published our results in JAMA a couple of weeks ago showing that there, were no, there was no significant difference in the overall hemoglobin A1C for, for our patients. Um, as we're implementing virtual care across CareMore, um, we're not doing it in this sort of Uber or Lyft type way where a stranger takes care of you every single time that you actually need to access care. But we're actually implementing continuity in our relationships with our patients. So it's the same person providing you virtual care as opposed to a stranger on every single occasion. Guys, I'm not, you know, there's plenty of folks who are gonna be talking about rocket science today. I clearly am not. But the problem with a lot of what's happening in the aging space is that we are, again, applying heuristics that don't apply to this population uh, to, the, to them. And as a result, we're giving people really inferior service. Um, I think what we're doing is working. Um, a few months after we announced our uh, chief togetherness officer, uh, the UK government appointed a minister for loneliness. Um, I thank HBS for giving, for giving me the uh, foresight to brand loneliness a little bit more positively as togetherness. Um, but I think you know, people are taking note that the biggest problems that we have to challenge, that we have to, the prob biggest challenges that we have to take on in our society um, aren't you know, getting digital knickknacks on people's phones but again, solving these more uh, basic issues that actually really make a difference. And again, I think you know, large enterprise is taking note of this. Um, Lyft is now starting to recruit veteran industry healthcare talent to try to, again, bring humanity to uh, the work they're doing to actually support medical transportation. And so hopefully I've given you a feel for how I believe that business, I think when pointed in the right direction with the right intent can actually build new social constructs. Um, this is about committing to making a difference together. And I think broader, meaningful change is not going to happen through the lens of financial success alone. We've already achieved that in our society. We have already shown that aging can, can, can make people money. Um, so this is, I think, less a conversation about generating value and more a conversation about how we can actually implement values uh, into the business of aging. So thank you and uh, really look forward to your questions.